So, really, in a really quick overview, I want you to sort of get used to thinking again about what's a gene, what's a chromosome, mitosis and meiosis. So, I'm almost positive that all of you have covered this sometime in your past. It may have been a while ago, but we need this information before we get into inheritance of disease genes. So this is the setup for Friday's lecture on inheritance of disease genes. And so think about when you, when you learned about parts of a cell and you learned about the nucleus, what did you learn back then that what the nucleus is? The control center. The control center of the cell. Wow. The nucleus is important because it contains the DNA. And the DNA contain instructions for making the organism, is a better way that I like to think about it. And when you, in the past or even in lab now, when you're looking at a cell, and say that you're looking at a cuboidal, simple cuboidal epithelium, and you look for cells and you look for the nucleus as this round dot in the cell. And most of the time it will look like this. And what is making the darkness of the dot is all of the DNA that is packed into that nucleus. And the DNA, if you stretched it all out, it's the double helix. But in most organisms, you have these chromosomes, which are linear pieces of DNA. So here's our double helix. And the double helix actually twists and compacts into chromosomes. And the chromosomes may be in this version or they may be diffuse, and we'll look at that in a minute. But the DNA is in the nucleus, and the DNA is the instructions to build proteins and to build enzymes, which are made out of proteins, and allow organisms to function. So DNA is incredibly important. The next thing that I want to review with you is the concept of What's a chromosome? What's a gene? What's an allele? And this picture I find really useful. This lecture, I'm getting some of this from um, another class that I've taught in the past, and this is not from your book. I don't particularly like how our book teaches this section. But what we've got here are two chromosomes, and they have two different colors. What do the colors indicate? which parent you got it from, yeah. So let's say that the red one is from the dad and the blue one is from the mom. And we've got two versions of this particular chromosome. And each chromosome has on it particular genes. So this chromosome, how many genes is it showing on here? Three. There's a lot more, it's just showing three. How many genes on this one? And notice that for this version of the chromosome and this version of the chromosome, this gene is in some way equivalent to this gene, and they're calling them big P, big P. These two genes are in some way equivalent to each other, and they're calling them small a, small a. These two genes are also in some way equivalent, but they've got different letters on them and that's referring to alleles. So what I want to do next is in your slide packet, you've got a blank slide next and it says definitions. And this is for you to write some stuff that I'm going to write on the board in that space, but I'm going to leave the board, I'm going to leave this picture up while I talk about definitions. And if you, if you already know these definitions really well, I'm really proud of your previous teachers, but sometimes I find that people, if they haven't talked about this in a while, that it might be hazy what a chromosome is and what a gene is and what an allele is. So let's put some definitions here. And these are not book definitions. These are functional definitions that will help you be able to understand Friday's lectures, what this is for. So a chromosome as we're going to think about it, is a continuous piece of DNA. 
So one long piece of DNA and it's continuous and it's um, a long extended double helix. So let me show, show how that would look on here. So here's our double helix and it's getting compacted and wrapped around proteins, snaking around and together that forms a chromosome. So this would be a chromosome right here. Over here, this is a separate piece of DNA and that's a different chromosome. So chromosomes are made out of DNA. It's a long, linear, continuous piece. Okay, gene. Blake, what do you think a gene is? Pick on you. A specific code that is good for good for something? Is that what you said? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else have you learned about what a gene is? A small piece of DNA. A small piece of DNA. Wyatt, what do you remember what a gene is? Nothing specific. Nothing specific? The reason I ask is because it depends on what kind of biology class you had as to what a gene is. So, a gene, here's what we're going to say a gene is for this class. If you go on further into biology, you're going to learn a lot more specific definition of this. But a gene is a piece of DNA that can produce a protein. So it has all the information that you need to make a protein. And that may have been what some of you learned a gene was in other classes before. Or sometimes a gene can make a useful functional RNA. So if, if there's something that we need particular RNAs for, like a transfer RNA, or a ribosomal RNA, or a uh, small interfering RNA. There are genes for those two. So a gene, I kind of probably like Catherine's definition best for what you need to know for this class. It's a little short piece of DNA, and it conveys useful information to make a protein or to make a useful RNA. So a little piece. That's what a gene is. Now we come to allele. What have you learned in the past that an allele is? Isn't that the part that's like can physically be seen? Sometimes alleles can physically be seen if they're a dominant allele. That does come into play. So let's look at these are alleles of the P gene. So let's say that P, um, let's say that P is a gene that allows for bone growth or something like that. So it's some kind of protein that's involved in bone growth. And the alleles are genes. So an allele is a gene, usually. An allele is a gene, but it's a version of a gene. A version of a gene. So if a gene is a car, an allele is a Ford Explorer, we'll say, like my car. It's a version of a gene. When we have two versions and they're exactly the same, that's what we call homozygous, and we'll come back to that on Friday. The versions are exactly the same. Like two 2003 red Ford Explorers, which there are multiple of that in this town. What about these two versions? Same or different? different. They're different. They, they are both encoding the same type of gene, B, which will say this one is involved in bone density. It's a protein involved in bone density. 
So this one has something to do with bone density, so does this one, but they're slightly different versions. That's what makes them alleles. So they're different versions, and the versions have different DNA sequences. The sequences have to be different. If we say that the alleles are the same, that means that the DNA that's making that allele is the same in both pieces. So A, little a would have the same DNA sequence as little a here. So we call these kind of alleles homozygous, these heterozygous. This picture is super useful. I, I will keep coming back to it from time to time. Um, what, what kind of alleles do you remember studying when you first heard of this? Eye color. Eye color. Hair color. Hair color. Pea plants. Yeah, pea plants. The peas are wrinkly, the peas are smooth. The peas are yellow, the peas are green. And then there are also disease alleles as well. So I'm going to be most focused on disease alleles. Okay, so related to disease alleles, this is why alleles and genes matter to disease. So what would we call this, this item right here? This is a chromosome. It's a long, continuous piece of DNA. They're pulling out this little region of it, and we would represent this as being a gene. So this piece would be a gene. It gets transcribed to messenger RNA, gets translated to this purple thing, which is what? Protein. Purple is usually protein in biology books in the US for some reason. Purple protein. So this protein, I need to move this back over to point at the picture. This purple protein is the protein that is most involved in the disease cystic fibrosis. Any of you ever done research on this or written a paper about it and know what this protein really does? Sounds very boring. So this protein is a translocator protein that moves chloride ions outside cells. That's what it is. And people that have the disease allele of this protein, so we can talk about the wild type allele, that's the normal version of this protein. This protein moves chloride ions like that outside the cell at a certain rate in the, in the normal version. People that have the disease allele or the disease version of this protein, it's not very good at moving chloride. And that causes them to have cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis affects multiple organ systems, including the lungs, liver, pancreas, intestines, the reproductive tract, and the skin. All because this protein is messed up. Because they have the disease allele. And so the first, I think the first final, um, I guess I'll go ahead and say this. The first final that I wrote for AMP2, I used cystic fibrosis as the disease and I based the final around it. Because look how many things Respiratory system, digestive system, reproductive system. I didn't bring skin into it, but talked about, you know, here's this disease and it affects all these body systems. So we'll have diseases for our final. It's not going to be cystic fibrosis. I'm going to use this as the example. But I'm going to try to draw, draw on here. So here's a plasma membrane. Here's this protein that's supposed to be pumping chloride out. It's supposed to be pumping chloride out. If it can't pump chloride out, not enough water follows it. Oh my goodness, it's osmosis again. It's osmosis again. 
So if you can't get enough chloride pumped out, you don't have enough water following it. And what this does is it causes secretions in the body are too thick or they're too viscous. They don't have, they're not watery enough. So every secretion, basically, in the body that people make, it doesn't have enough water in the secretion. So what's their sweat like? You know any people that have this? Or? Very salty. It's very salty because there's not enough water coming out with, with the sweat. It's too concentrated. Um, what's their respiratory mucus like? really thick. It's so thick it's hard for them to cough it out and pathogens tend to get trapped in there and it causes a lot of infections. Um, their pancreatic secretions are too thick. Hmm, their pancreatic secretions are too thick and too concentrated and they tend to clog up um, the ducts that empty into the small intestine. So they have to take digestive enzymes to help digest their food. Um, their semen and cervical mucus are too thick. That's what makes them infertile. All from this, one wrong protein, one DNA sequence change, all from this. So cystic fibrosis, a lot of people learn about the genetics of it because it's a, it's a recessive disease, it's a single gene. It is, and we'll work through some examples of this on Friday, of how it's inherited and um, who's a carrier and things like that. But one, one disease, a genetic cause, it affects multiple body systems. So that's, that's the kind of thing that you'll be working through with your finals, except it will be different diseases. You'll look at the inheritance of it, how does it affect the different body systems, and I kind of relate it to the way that I teach this class. So that's kind of what's coming. It just won't be for cystic fibrosis. Um, and I'm probably, I probably will show you, you know, next Wednesday I'll show you what the test was for cystic fibrosis as an example. So that you can kind of see, see what to expect. Okay. So... To understand inheritance of these genes, we need to look at chromosomes and review a little bit about meiosis and mitosis. So here's our double helix. It's twisted around these proteins called histones, and it's forming this tight, compacted fiber called chromatin. And this is supercoiled chromatin. And when you see chromosomes that have a linear shape they look like rods or they look like X's, that's when DNA is compacted the most. So this version down here, this is super compacted DNA um, and it's forming chromatids and together we call this the chromosome. And this is a space saving mechanism. When do you see chromosomes look like this in the life of a cell? Is it like this all the time? It's not like this all the time. We'll come back to that in a minute. It's like this sometimes in this form of sister chromatids. So this would be a sister chromatid, this would be a sister chromatid, and they're stuck together at this region called centromere. But it's not like this all the time. How many chromosomes do people have? Forty-six in most cells, most of the time, and they're in 23 pairs. That's a thing that, I don't know, tends to come up on tests of just general biology knowledge. Forty-six chromosomes. So we have 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs. And this is a picture that has taken one person's chromosomes 
and use computer software to put the versions together by length and then give them fake colors. And this type of arrangement is called a karyotype. Um, is this a man or a woman and how do you know? It's a man. So they've got an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. One X, one Y. X, Y. This is a male. So we divide human chromosomes into 23 different types. 22 of them are called autosomes. 22 autosomes and then one set of sex chromosomes, which are X and Y or X and X if you're female. And how is chromosome 1 different from chromosome 13? What's different about those in this picture? These are arranged by length. These are arranged by length. So from 1 to 22, arranged by length, 22 are the shortest versions, chromosomes of chromosome number one are the longest versions. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Uh, that's that's something that like in my husband's class he does a whole hour and a half lecture on it. But normally you can be XY or XX male gender, female gender. There are XXY, rarely. Is that getting that what you're asking? No, I'm talking about like the whole thing like... No. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's two, right? Like, it's only two outcomes? Yeah, no, normally. There's only two kinds of sex chromosomes. Yeah, yeah, Yes, okay, yeah, there's only two kinds of sex chromosomes. There's the X version and the Y version. Sorry, the, the X version is a lot longer than the Y version. Sorry. I thought you were asking a more bigger question. No, I was trying to avoid that. Okay, I'm not trying to avoid that, but that topic is, is yeah, it takes a long time to talk about. But 23 types, and notice... Each person has two versions of each type, and one version is coming from each of their parents. So if we just look at number eight, one version is from this person's mom, one version is from this person's dad. And it's the same for, for every set. So we call the versions homologous chromosomes. And homologous chromosomes, let's make a note about this, homologous chromosomes are always the same length info about homologous chromosomes chromo yeah chromosomes they're the same length they ought to have the same kinds of genes Let's put the same general kinds of genes in the same order, but they're going to have different sequences. And probably different alleles. So I want to go back to our red and blue chromosome cartoon now and look at those homologs a little bit more. So, these two are homologs of a chromosome. We could say this, these are homologs of chromosome 4. There's one version from the dad. There's one homolog from the dad of this person. There's one homolog from the mom of this person. They're the same length. They've got the same kinds of genes, generally in the same order. But they're not going to have exactly the same sequence. See how they've got different alleles at this place? They might have the same alleles at this place, but 
homologs are not 100% the same all down their length. Seem okay? Homologs. Or homologous chromosomes. So what I want to do next is do a really brief um, overview of mitosis. Really brief overview of what mitosis is. What do you remember about mitosis? Cell replication. Yeah. How do you recognize it under a microscope? It's got phases. So here's what mitosis is generally like. So similar to before, you write this on your slide, but I'm going to put it over here. Mitosis if it works right, it's going to make identical copies of the dividing cell. So for example, if I give myself an Indian burn on my hand, why would I do that? I don't know. I'm not 12. But if I did and I scraped off skin cells, um, it would grow back, my skin cells would divide, and they would make more of themselves and replace what was there. So mitosis, you can consider it to be ordinary cell division. This is ordinary cell division. And most of the cell division that goes on in your whole entire body is mitosis. So for human cells, we're taking a cell that has 46 chromosomes, it copies its DNA, and for a brief moment it's going to have 92 chromosomes, and then it's going to go through those stages, which I learned as PMAT. I still know that when I'm old and have Alzheimer's. PMAT and Roy G. Biv and that stuff. And then and then we end up with two, chromos two cells that both have 46 chromosomes and we can consider that they are genetically the same as this cell. This is a replacement cell division process. So that's kind of an overview of mitosis. I've got a few slides here that are going to go through the stages. And the stages are not particularly important for this class, but it may be useful for you to review them before you go on to whatever your next uh, phase in your science studies are. Um, and this is, what are the stages of the cell cycle? The first one is actually not part of mitosis. That's interphase. So if I were going to put interphase over here, interphase is the in-between time when the cell is just living its normal life and you look at the nucleus and it looks like a round, dark blob. It's probably interphase. So toward the end of interphase, this could still be interphase over here because the cell has to copy the DNA before it divides. You've got to have two copies um, of all of your chromosomes before you divide. Otherwise, these cells won't end up with the DNA that they need. So when I am teaching mitosis stages, and I'm trying to teach people to look for how you recognize interphase, it's smooth nucleus. We don't have chromosomes condensing. It just looks like a round blob or just a normal looking cell. That's interphase. If a cell is going to divide and actually do mitosis, after interphase, it will go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And in these stages, the chromosomes are more condensed than usual. The chromosomes, they don't look like smooth DNA anymore. They don't look like relaxed DNA. They're really, really condensed and tightened up and compacted into visible chromosomes. 
And this is because these are going to get dragged all over the cell. And it's like if you, I know people do this, but if you, I've done this, take the Christmas lights down off of your tree and you just like drag them into the hall and then you throw them in a bin, some of them are going to break. They will. And new, newer Christmas lights, you can have some break and the whole thing will still work. But um, if your mom or anybody that you know like takes them down and then they wrap them or they twist them around wheels so that they're easier to handle and move, that's like chromosome uh, condensation, this tightening. So when you're looking at mitosis under a microscope, you're always looking for well, what, are the, what are the chromosomes doing right now. That's, that's the exception. You only see chromosomes tightened up and compacted like that during mitosis. Most of the time in the cell's life, the DNA is in this version, more relaxed and more usable to make proteins. This is actually how cells' DNA looks most of the time, not in chromosomes like this, not in condensed chromosomes. But during prophase, we've got chromosome compaction. The nuclear envelope breaks down because the chromosomes are going to have to move. So this breaks down. The chromosomes start attaching to the spindle. That's prophase. And then the chromosomes will start to line up in the middle of the cell. That's metaphase. So cartoon version. Um, More colorful version. Sorry, I forgot to move the camera video watchers. Okay. I always liked to see metaphase on the lab exams. Like, yes, I know that's metaphase. They're lined up in the middle. And then in anaphase is when we've got chromosomes splitting apart from each other, going to opposite ends of the cell. Um, we then call them daughter chromosomes during anaphase. And if you're looking at this under the microscope, you want to look for two lines of chromosomes in the same cell. Anaphase. And then the last phase is telophase. And telophase is basically the reverse of prophase. So we get chromosomes starting to relax. We start to form a new nuclear membrane. Uh, the spindle falls apart. And you may also have going on at that time the cytoplasm dividing too. That's cytokinesis. So cytokinesis. is technically not within mitosis, it can happen at the end of it. And I always teach students when you're looking for telophase under the microscope, you should look for the start of cytokinesis because a lot of times those go together. They go together. And you look for, oh, we've got two nuclei still technically in one cell here. That's telophase. I want to go back, whoops, that's forward, not back. Oh, let's do this first. So here's a cell from the outside. Like this could be a zygote. That could be a zygote right there. It probably is. It's doing its first cell division, and if you look from the outside, you can't see the chromosome stuff happening. But you can see cytokinesis starting to divide those cells, and it's called cleavage furrow with cytokinesis. I'm not going to go back. I need to keep going forward. So don't be, that's just a review for stages of mitosis in case you need it for other classes later and you haven't looked at it in a while. I want to next talk about meiosis and do a similar thing where you write the general info for meiosis on your slide, but I'm going to put it over here. And I'm going to make it next to the one for mitosis so that we can compare them. So here's for mitosis. We'll do 
do a similar description for meiosis. Where does meiosis happen in your body? only in sex organs. It's only in the primary sex organs. So it's only in the testes, only in the ovaries. I did not even realize until I was embarrassingly older that that was a fact. And that really helped me once I figured that out. Like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> we don't need to be doing meiosis in other parts of the body because that's, we just need ordinary cell division to replace ordinary cells. So meiosis only happens in the testes and the ovaries because it produces what we call haploid cells, which in people, our gametes, our sperm and eggs, are haploid. So meiosis takes a cell with 46 chromosomes, this says 46 chromosomes, if you're watching the video. It still copies its DNA, it briefly will have 92 chromosomes, and then it goes through two rounds of cell division which are called meiosis 1, meiosis 2. And we end up with gametes. And how many chromosomes does each gamete have? It's one of those two numbers. It's 23. 23. At this point, in between meiosis 1 and 2, we have cells that would have 46 briefly. But then there's a second round of cell division, and we make gametes that have 23 chromosomes. This is useful because if we're going to have, oh, it's so good. Okay. Such a good drawing sperm, meat, egg, and fuse and form a zygote, the zygote needs to have 46 chromosomes. Thus, the sperm needs to have 23, the egg needs to have 23. Seem okay? We're not going to go through all the eight stages of meiosis. Yay, I'm too happy. I'm happy. <laughs> it's one of my least favorite things to teach. But, the gametes have to have half the number of the normal cells. If we're going to form you know, zygote, so these two together form the zygote, which has 46 chromosomes, and then the zygote will mainly divide by mitosis to form the blastocyst and further stages of the embryo and so on. So meiosis is, is kind of rare in your body. It's only in the testes, it's only in the ovaries. We use it to make gametes. Gametes have half our normal chromosome number. So here's kind of what that looks like. So here's our starting cell. They say we've got 46 chromos chromosomes, each with two chromatids. That's because they've already copied. They've already been copied. So it's 92 in total. Um, we go through the first meiotic division. We go through the second meiotic division. These are the gametes. And notice, each gamete only has one version of each chromosome. Each gamete only has one version of each chromosome. So if we picked out this one, and I drew over here, 
So that one, it has one homologue for chromosome 1. It has one homologue for chromosome 2, and so on, and so on, and so on. This one is so, so if these are, what is this, sperm? Is this about sperm? Oh, it doesn't say yet. Okay, so if these, if these are eggs, let's say, and this is my egg, and this is chromosome 2, right here, this version of chromosome 2 is either the one that my dad gave me or the one that my mom gave me. Doesn't have both anymore. It's only got one of them. So it's Bob's or it's Karen's. This one could also be Bob's or Karen's. Those are my parents' names. But I've only got one of it. And so it's kind of it kind of gets mixed up as to which which chromosomes came from which parents when you form the gametes during meiosis. And then this is the point also where you have crossing over. I'm not going to get into details of crossing over, but this is where it happens. It's during meiosis. How well did this... Oh, it's just all gray. That's not helpful. I'm sorry. If you've got black and white printouts, they're not helpful at all, but they're in color on here. So when we've got pairs of duplicated chromosomes and they line up together during meiosis, you can have crossing over and you can have swapping of pieces. Um, if you, those of you that have got sheets, make a note that this one is red and this one is green and then I want you to write something else on here. That's helpful. So we're going to call this chromosome 1. We'll say that these are all versions of chromosome 1. Call this paternal, sorry, paternal, I couldn't think of that word. Paternal for the dad, paternal homologue 1 like PH1, paternal homologue 1. This is maternal homologue 1, MH1. And these are copied. So when you see chromosomes in this form and they look like an X, this side is exactly the same as this side. Those are the copies. This is a cell that's getting ready to divide. It's copied its DNA. So this is exactly the same as this. This would also be paternal homologue 1. Totally the same. Totally the same. These two are totally the same. If this is maternal homologue 1, this is an exact copy of it, maternal homologue 1. Are these two the same? These two would be homologs. They would have generally the same kinds of genes in the same order, but they would have different alleles. They have different alleles. If this is confusing, don't worry too much about it. It's not going to come into play in this class too much. Okay. So here's another way to look at that. Um, Red is paternal, right? So here's the dad's versions of chromosome chromosome one, and notice they are exactly the same as each other. They're copies. Here's the mom's versions of chromosome one, and they are exactly the same as the as each other, but their versions are not the same as the dad's versions. These two are separate homologs. These two are exact copies of each other. These two are exact copies of each other. And then we could go through and say, well, for this gene it's heterozygous, for this gene it's homozygous. But in the gametes, right down here that these are gametes. Look, if these are sperm, and this is a sperm cell, it only got one parental homolog. Moms or dads. 
This is the mom's because it's green. It's only got one version of chromosome one. This one only got the dad's version of chromosome one. These two crossed over and they've got a little bit of mix and match. Um, that increases the variability of the sperm. Um, how many of you have ever watched Monty, Monty Python movies? There's, there's this song in there. I don't know which movie it's in because I didn't watch them all, but it goes, every, every sperm is sacred. Every sperm is something. And they go on and, um, anyway. <laughs> Relating that to this. So this is showing, if these are sperm and it's showing that it only has one of chromosome one, it also has one of every other chromosome. Um, but, if you take sperm as a group, or eggs as a group, and you compare them genetically to, to each other, it's possible that somewhere there's one other sperm that's exactly like that one, but it's unlikely. It's more likely that each individual sperm is genetically different from all the others because of crossing over, because of independent assortment. Um, the sperm is not a zygote, the sperm is not a new, complete, diploid individual in any way, but they are genetically different from each other. So, anyway. if you've heard that song, now you won't think about it the same way. But they, that team was very smart group of people, <laughs> basing it on this concept. Um, this picture is pretty much the same as what we looked at before, it's just, except just showing, you know, instead of this, the DNA in the sperm cell are really up in the head region, but these would have different genetic uh, material in each one. Okay, so I want to come back to this slide again. Could a sperm cell have both of these at once? It's not supposed to. Sometimes that happens. It's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to have only one version or the other. So let's say that this is, I'll go back to myself again. If this is my chromosome four, I've got the parental chromosome from my dad, Bob, the maternal chromosome homolog from my mom, Karen. When I make eggs, each egg is only supposed to get this or this, not both. Not both. And I want to write one more thing for you. Uh, okay. That I hope that you already know, but I did not already know this for a very long time and when I found it out it really helped me when I worked kind of squares. Okay, see this? I'm going to copy some of the terminology from that over to here. We're going to just look at the B gene, okay? So, um, we're going to make a Punnett square with this B gene. Okay, this is me what alleles of B do I have? Big B, little b. And that's my genotype. We're going to go over that on Friday. That's me. That's my genotype. One of these came from my mom, one from my dad. Dad, mom, sorry. And I know you all know how to do Punnett squares. Like, that's working great in high school biology. <laughs> People can do a Punnett square. This is a genotype. And when you copy one letter into each box, it's because I can only put in my eggs one version of the parental homolog. I did not get that until years after I had been doing Punnett squares. Kind of embarrassing. So in case, <laughs> in case that's you, that's really helpful to understand. That's really helpful. So I could give an egg my mom's allele. I could give an egg my dad's allele. Why do we have two rows? Like that's all I can give an egg. I can give an egg this or this. 
What's the point of this second row? The the yeah, because these are representing completeness of it is a, is a zygote. Because we're assuming there's a dad. So if you just made a Punnett square that just represents possibilities for sperm and egg, it'd just be one row. Like, I could give an egg this, or I could give an egg this. But we intend these to represent zygotes. So what, if I wrote over here, firstly, why would I write anything over here? The other parent, which in these days is, you know, a male. That may, there may come a day when people can fuse two eggs together. But this would be their genotype, their homozygous, and they could give, they could give this into a sperm, they could give this into a sperm. They happen to be the same, but these, you know, it's like, oh, it's little b, little b. That's fertilization, that's making a zygote. That's why we have two rows. So we're going to do Punnett squares on Friday. Um, I hope that you're not just like, you know, filling it in and doing it, but it will make more sense why they are that way. That's what we'll be doing Friday. Bring your, um, you'll need to bring handouts for Friday. Those should be appearing tomorrow sometime on Blackboard, and we will have a quiz on Friday.